Oh, good point, Jay. Jay? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm, I hit recording. I missed everything Andrew said. So, Andrew, we'll have to record what you said. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're now recording, Jay? Yes, you are recording. Okay. So can you bring up the poll? Yeah. I have launched the poll. Jay has launched the poll. So this is this is who are you? If you manage software developers directly, answer that first one. Um, and if you're one of those other roles, grab the role that represents you. No surprise, we have a lot of Scrum Masters and Agile coaches as part of this group. Four software development managers so far of the folks who've answered. Four product managers and product owners. That's really cool. Let me know when you want to end it. It's you got oh, you got most people. Got most of the people. I'd say I'd take a screenshot of that and end it. Take a screenshot of that on behalf of figure, figuring out who we all are when we've got an audience here at uh, Enterprise Agile San Francisco. I just now shared the results. Can you see them? All right. Can anybody else answer whether they can see the results, or did you see? Oh uh, yes, I can see. Yep. Yeah, we can see them. All right, great. All right, so let's move along. So we've got a few managers among us, and um, and many of you who are affected by managers. So we're gonna we're gonna move along. And uh, and I'll and I'll note that I got into tech as a programmer, uh, as Andrew said. Um, I spent seven years, uh, got, uh, got some patents and uh, uh, wrote a couple of books on programming and got a couple of things that I wrote on covers of magazines. And then I made a move to manage and then my move to manage was to Apple computer. And so you can see uh, that spiral right there shows you my, my uh, career through full-time employment. Um, and uh, I, I left Apple after seven years. I, I, uh, got to manage the uh, the team doing the UX of the Macintosh for three years, the team developing Apple's crown jewels, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, 22 years ago, I encountered Agile for the first time. Sorry, the poll came up again and it prevents me from moving forward. There we go. Uh, 22 years ago, I encountered Agile for the first time. I was at Charles Schwab. Um, we uh, actually, it was in the form of extreme programming. And 22 years ago, that was 1999. Uh, 1999, Schwab had brought up web trading only three years before. Um, we measured downtime at that point in millions of dollars per minute. If we had, if we had a minute of downtime, it could cost us millions of dollars. And I had, and I was leading an initiative across all of Schwab to move all of Schwab's application development across somewhere around 1,400 developers at Schwab at the time uh, to move all of that to, to a single platform, to, to Java actually at that point. Um, and here was a vice president in the, international, in the international business unit who was using something called extreme programming. And I thought, boy, millions of dollars per minute in downtime and extreme anything, how, how, where's, where's the fit here? Um, it turned out though, when I looked into it, that, um, that extreme programming had been created by someone I had met at Apple, a guy named Kent Beck up in Oregon. We brought him down and he did some workshops for us and, um, and some brown bags uh, and some uh, lunch talks that were um, interesting, intriguing, but I wasn't yet sold. I ran into Scrum then oh, three years later for the first time when I was also when I was at Schwab and, and thought, wow, uh, I, I had a colleague who was doing this thing called Scrum in 2002. And the, I think there's somebody who's not on mute, Jay, if you can help me out. Um, 
or we could listen to their phone call. <laughs> uh, my colleague was doing Scrum at Schwab and I said, so what's this stuff called Scrum? Because I hadn't heard of Scrum yet in 2002. And he said, well, developers get to go heads down for two weeks at a time and not be interrupted. And I thought, wow, I've not seen developers get to go heads down for two weeks at a time and not be interrupted in my entire career. That's pretty cool. But the other part of that is I've also been a product manager briefly, you know, for a year and a half at Apple um, and a little bit elsewhere. And the competition changes, the world changes, things change. How does that work? And he said, well, you know, so developers plan two weeks. They go heads down, they work on it, they deliver it, and then they're ready for the next thing. And, and, and on those two-week boundaries, product management can come in and, and they can do a 180 degree turn. That's fine because the developers are ready for the next thing that's gonna deliver the most value to our customers. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really the yin and yang of software development, developers getting focus and product managers in our business being able to change directions uh, as we need to. Uh, you know, what a, what a marvelous combination of things. So I began training teams in Scrum then uh, 12 years ago, began training friends teams first, and then, um, and then began doing uh, uh, training teams as a pretty regular basis. I, um, 16 years ago, my co-author and I began crafting one of the very few books on managing software people and teams in the history of software development. We went looking for books on managing software developers. You know, there's a ton, all of you know, that there's a ton of books on Agile. There's a ton of books on project management that's even larger than the number of books on Agile. There are hundreds probably in each of those categories. And yet we could only find six books in the history of programming on managing the people who deliver projects. Um, and so, and we had walked into our own programming jobs, both of us, without having a touch of training in what it meant to be a manager. And so we thought, you know, we'd, we'd been managing for um, quite a number of years, both of us at that point and thought, you know, we really ought to write this down and share what we've learned for those people who are coming after us. And we also realized that um, we'd been sharing rules of thumb with each other, rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom. And that um, we've been um, mentoring each other in rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom from a huge number of wise people across software development. And we thought we should collect those together. And so that's the center section of our book is 300 rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom. Um, a year ago, after four printings and translation into four languages, uh, Addison Wesley brought out a second edition. So the first edition came out nine years ago, the second edition a year ago, um, and it's updated throughout. Uh, uh, all of my career has been about untangling knots in software development. And, uh, and product teams, it's been about making software development hum. And uh, as Andrew said, I parachute in as an interim VP of engineering from time to time. I also help organizations to assess where they are and, and what changes they could make uh, to tweak their organizations that would make a significant difference. Uh, and then I interweave from time to time um, agile trainings and scrum and Kanban trainings um, into that to um, help organizations do their software process more effectively. Uh, three years ago, O'Reilly asked Addison Wesley to ask us to turn our book into video training. And in doing so, we added one chapter. And that chapter was called, If You Are Agile, What Do Managers Do? And uh, we, we, had, we had, in the in the several years since the book was published, discovered managers really struggling with the question of, what's my role and do I have a role? now that our, our organization has, has gone agile. So this talk is based on that chapter. And it's a chapter that was not only, we not only added to the video training, but we added it to the second edition of the book when it came out a year ago. So I'm also the author of the periodic study of product team performance. And the study of product team performance, and I'm gonna share some results with you tonight. The study of product team performance, we've done six of them so far. We're uh, just finishing a seventh, uh, a pandemic edition. We ask people on product teams all over the world, people who are product managers, who are developers, who are development managers, who are testers, who are project managers, who are uh, scrum masters, who are coaches, people on product teams all over the world in all of the roles to characterize their team. Is it high performance? Is it low performance? Is it something in between? And then we ask about specific practices that we're curious about to see 
whether they correlate with high performance teams. Many of them don't, many of them, there's not a correlation, but uh, on the ones that we find, they're very intriguing and interesting. I'm gonna share a couple of those with you tonight. So I wanna take a census of the group and, the, and we've done a census of who you are what I want to know is for, the, is for those of you, so we've, we've got only a few managers, but I'm curious of those of you who are managers, have, did you get training in management? Uh, those of you who are managing developers specifically, did you get training in management before you became a, uh, a manager? So uh, uh, Jay, can you put up the second poll? Ooh, and those are, those are cut off. So that first one is I'm not and have never been a software engineering manager. The second one, uh, I'm an engineering manager, but I've had no formal training in, in, in management. And the third one is I'm an engineering manager. I've had one or more days of training in managing. Ron, was that um, training? Be, you said training before you became a manager. I, I was, what if you had training after becoming a manager? Yeah, so uh, uh, unfortunately, I intended there to be four answers to this question. And so both of those are going to be the third, the third answer. Sorry, Kevin. So I'd love to, I'd love to be capturing both of those, whether, whether, whether it was before or after. So what we're finding is that we've had 20 people who've been engineering managers, two thirds of them, two thirds of them have never had formal training in management, which is, which is pretty consistent with, um, uh, I've asked tons of managers this question. Roughly half have never had a day of training in management. Roughly 5%, roughly 95% did not have a, a day of training in management before they became managers. Uh, the result of the, the result of that is, uh, you know, we're not very good managers when we begin managing um, almost almost to a one. I'll certainly sign up for that myself. I don't think I was a very good manager when I started managing, and um, and it and it's tough for those folks who are in our teams when that um, when that happens. So. Isn't it odd how long we expect programmers to have studied the art of programming? and how little we expect managers to have studied the art of managing. And then we get managers who um, began before the era of agile or began before their agile was very effectively agile and suddenly find themselves with everything changing. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, managers are in that here, you are here spot Management roles do change in Agile. Uh, the, there, and, and I'm going to give you four categories. Uh, and I'm going to uh, talk mostly about the ones that change, but there are familiar management roles that teams still need. So I'm going to very briefly talk about a few of those. Um, there are roles and styles that are, that are truly inappropriate, uh, and, they're, and thus they're deprecated uh, for managers in Agile, in Agile that's being done well. There are roles that change and, uh, and sometimes dramatically, and that's what I'll spend the most time on. And then there are roles that are brand new with Agile. Actually, I'll spend part of, part of that most time on this one as well. So those four, I think, are the categories that we can look at. Uh, but there is still a manager role. It's just that it's a changed manager role. Um, what we look at when, uh, when a typical training trainer draws uh, a picture of a scrum team, you know, this, this is a pretty typical drawing of a scrum team. It's got a scrum master and a product owner, and there's the team, and, and, uh, and the scrum master and product owner talk to the business owner and talk to the stakeholders, and, and there's no manager in this picture. The team is self-organizing, the team is self-managing team, uh, in fact, Agile done well represents the shift from managers in charge to teams in charge. But the rest of the organization may still think we direct things because the senior management may never have figured out what the heck this Agile stuff is. So managers are pretty much stuck in the middle 
believe no, it, to, to the extent that they understand their role and how much it's changed and yet knowing that their bosses may not know that and so there there there's a, a rock and a hard place uh, that, that uh, managers find themselves in the problem uh, to start with is that when we draw this picture managers aren't in it and uh, and so managers have a tough time managers typically are Manager roles are typically not included in um, most agile training that I've seen. Um, I want to point out that the uh, center section of our book is rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom. And I'm pointing that out because I'm about to share one with you and I'm going to share some more as we go along. This one from Mike Cohn, a common misconception is that because of this reliance on self-organizing teams, there's little or no role for leaders of agile teams. Nothing could be further from the truth. When we put together the, the table of contents, this is basically the table of contents for the uh, first edition of the book. As I said, the second edition, we added a, one more chapter on uh, the role of managers in Agile. But when you look down the first edition's table of contents, there's really only one of these that changes dramatically. And that's this one, managing successful software delivery changes dramatically from uh, pre-Agile to truly Agile. But the rest of these, there's some real similarities to, um, to managers' roles on these things. And so with that, I want to walk into an exercise. And we're going to go into breakout rooms. I've got a Google, I've got a Google spreadsheet for you. Um, and it's got five. Uh, so along the bottom of the Google spreadsheet are tabs, uh, as many spreadsheets do. The first tab, the, you're going to go into the spreadsheet. Jay, can you put the, um, the URL for the spreadsheet into the chat? So the, 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 uh, the sheet you're going to arrive on is a set of directions. Um, and the set of directions is, first of all, observe which Zoom breakout room you're in as you go into it. Uh, so I'm going to break you into five Zoom breakout rooms. And actually, let me bring up. Ah, I've got uh, I've got it actually on a slide. So um, what what you're gonna yeah I've got it on a slide and I've got it filled out. Um, uh, what you're gonna go in is you're gonna have a a blank left hand side of this, and and, and there are 50 roles on this sheet. And your your breakout group, uh, if you're in one, the very first. Uh, section is going to be highlighted. The, um, the uh, group two is going to have the second section highlighted and so on through the fifth section. You're going to fill out your, with, with your group, do a round of introductions first. So use this as a networking opportunity um, in, inside of your, uh, your group. Do a, a rapid round because I'm going to give you 10 minutes in the breakout room and you want to spend most of your time figuring out whether that role the role, so you've got a set of, of eight to 12 roles probably in your, in your, that your group is going to figure out. And they either change, not at all, they don't change a bit, or they change dramatically. Um, now, actually, I am going to bring this, this spreadsheet up. And let me share that. So I have to find Zoom again. Mm. Go to here, stop sharing, share something different. So you're gonna see this to start with. This is the instructions. You're gonna observe which Zoom breakout room you're in. Um, you're gonna choose the tab for the group number that matches. And you're gonna begin by introducing yourselves, your role in your company. And then your group is going to work out the set of responsibilities that are not grayed out and you're going to figure out your columns. And so let me go to group one. So here's group one. Notice that the top section is, is uh, brighter and the lower sections are gray. And I filled out one. I've said manage problem employees, fire poor performers changes very little, maybe changes not at all because I put a zero. Changes not at all for managers typically in Agile, typically teams look to managers to handle problem employees in their teams. They um, sometimes expect managers to know by, by osmosis who the problem employees or that they've got a problem uh, on their team uh, who needs to be managed out of their team, whether they're fired or whether they're moved to another team or not, depends on the uh, issue. 
notice there in the third group, load balance developer tasks changes dramatically. Managers don't load balance developer tasks in Agile. Uh, uh, teams do that. So uh, you can see there the, uh, the examples. Each of you has got an example. With that, let me stop sharing. Let me go to breakout rooms. Uh, recreate my breakout rooms and assign people automatically. I'm going to open all the rooms and send you to rooms for 10 minutes. Make sure I got that set. I do 10 minutes and then you'll get a 60 second warning to come back. Balaganesh, are you there? I'm not sure why you didn't move, but I can move you if you if you are there and want to be moved. Jay, I can do the same thing for you. No, I'm still working on the client crap. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so you hang out. You hang out here. If anybody comes back. Um, help them out. And I'm going to go visit breakout room. Okay. Hello. I had been assigned originally to room number one. And it popped you out? Yeah, well, my, I don't know, my network, I think, uh, wrapped out, but uh, yeah. All right, so let me send a note to Ron to put you back in. Thank you. Oh, also, do you have the, the link? Let me see if it's in the chat, because... Uh, my my system uh, oh well no when you get out mm -hmm. it doesn't keep the chat text no it doesn't it for everyone all right oops crap sent it to the wrong person hold on hmm. wow that's weird okay yeah, hopefully he gets it because it's not allowing me to pick him. Uh, yeah, I can only I guess pick you or me because oh, because we're only only two in the room. We're the only two in here, so he won't even get to see it. Mm. So let me <laughs> let me do this. Hold on. Uh, control C. Poop. Control B. Of course, that doesn't work. Shit. Hold on. Right. 
Okay, there's the link. Thank you. And then let's see what I can do with Ron. It does show me all the rooms since I'm the host. Where the hell is he? Huh? There he is. Cool. Well, I can actually move people and stuff. Cool, but I can't freaking chat to him. <laughs> All right, that's fine. I can just do text message. I don't know if he'll see it. Well, yeah, see if he sees it. There should be a way, since I'm the host, I should be able to communicate to any room. Yeah. Nope. Broadcast message to all. There we go. I'll see if he sees that. Mm. Did it show up on your chat? No, I don't see it showing up. It says I can message everybody, but it says but I don't see it. Oh, cool. All right.
<clears throat> so I uh, set the 60 second timer about 30 seconds ago. So we'll get everyone back, I think. And uh, I think we still got a group out yet at least. Is group two back? Yes. Yeah. Is group three back? All right, I think we've got everyone back. So uh, group one, uh, you've got someone to report. The question is, which responsibilities you disagree most about? And, uh, and, um, and which, uh, which responsibility ranking most surprised you as you did it? Group one. Well, the concept of onboarding uh, sparked a lot of questions for us as to how much of that was actually an HR kind of element and how much of that was something where it was really the team that was going to be taking the new person under the wing and getting them oriented. So we had more time allocated to that one. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And we fired him. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. And then we fired him. And then you fired him. Great. Uh, I'm going to suggest that there actually are two onboarding roles. One of them is HR and it's bringing people into benefits and bringing people into an understanding of the company. But there is one that's bringing people into the team. And, uh, and when we studied onboarding and the study of product team performance, what we found was that it was somewhere around 5% of teams that called out onboarding as a best practice. So uh, if you're looking for low hanging fruit, for improving the performance of your team, um, that's one. All right, uh, group two. Uh, we're group two, uh, and we did the uh, technical management one. Uh, they, uh, one of the issues that we came up with was, what were they doing before in this regard? And we, we kind of, you know, uh, had some problems on landing the number because uh, if they weren't doing it before and they're not doing it now, then there's no change. But if they were doing it before and they're not doing it now, then there is a change. So, uh, so is, I think that's uh, peculiar to this particular sub subset. Um, but that, so that's one of the reasons why, for example, in uh, the resolve technical disputes that we actually put two X's down. Uh, I, I said I would cheat and do that. Uh, so, uh, because it, it really depends on whether, uh, you know, they weren't doing it before. Uh, they were, you know, having the teams do it. So there's not much change. So, um, okay. so we were, we were uh, kind of all over the map. Uh, there, there was quite a bit of discussion on, uh, on, on the, many of these, uh, many of these. Cool. All right, team three. And team three, you're working on project team support. Okay, so what we did is we had everybody on the team go down through and mark where they said it, um, each one of them. And then we did some comparisons on the, where we had the biggest ranges. So one of them that we had spent some time discussing is monitoring progress. And, um, and we had a, almost a full range from two to five on that initially. And after some conversation, we landed on a four with that, um, that, they're, that they're, it's not totally a change, but, um, but there's a good bit of change in monitoring progress. And, um, and I think that uh, I don't, we didn't decide as a group um, which one surprised us the most. But I would say that I think that the thing that surprised me because we didn't get through talking through all of them is that we have some still have some broad ranges and um, where we, you know, have ones and five and something in between as well. So, uh, so definitely some 
could continue with some good conversation. Cool, cool, group four. Hi everyone, we had in your organization and we kind of, uh, our conversation was, you know, what's the ideal state versus what is actually happening. And so uh, one of our items match slash assign people to teams and projects. Um, we were saying that, you know, in an ideal um, agile environment, it would be a five. Um, practically speaking, it was more likely a two or a three. So we were kind of grappling with, with that on a couple of items actually. So um, I think that's kind of where we were diverging slash, um, you know, what we found surprising. Great, uh, team five. Sure, uh, the biggest contention was whether or not the word manage even applies in agile. But uh, the ones that really stood out were um, protecting reports from requirements whimsy and communicating uh, to key insights to stakeholders, whether or not that was still a manager's responsibility or spread out within the team. Um, the other surprising one was about metrics and who establishes those. We agreed that it was more the team's decision So uh, the one uh, the one that surprised me the most the first time I did this when I uh, when I saw teams take it on was was in the uh, was in that first category of growing uh, growing skills and careers and counseling mentoring and coaching um, and um, you know my take on my take on it had been going in well this is always a manager's job it's always a manager's job to support their support each of their people to grow their careers and to grow themselves and the most that they can do. What I found a whole bunch of people saying was, well, I never had time to do that before Agile. I was always on the, I was on, I was on the hook for uh, delivery and I never had time to actually grow people and coach them and mentor them and, um, and, and to help them with their careers. And, uh, and, and it was really remarkably different in, that, in the span of results that I saw there. So I want to say that, um, uh, there's no, right, there's no set of right answers for this. Um, I think what we're seeing, uh, what we see, and so another one, another one that really uh, foils getting a right answer is, is hiring. And uh, while managers probably have the same roles logistically with hiring, the people you're gonna hire for an agile team might have entirely different characteristics. So the activity is the same, uh, who you're looking for is different, which is, uh, which is um, it's either a zero or a five. So there's, there's a whole bunch of differences. Um, if you want my results, put your, put your email into the chat um, and, I'll send, uh, and I'll send out um, the results. I'll send out the page of results I'm about to show you, which is, which is my results and a reason why I, why I scored it the way I did. Uh, and so let me start sharing again so that we can see this. And go full screen. And so, uh, and so what you'll get is if, if you put your email in the, in the chat, I'll send you this. Um, and then um, I'll also send you some uh, resources that go with this uh, talk. So um, I want to move on though. Um, so there are, um, there are a few manager roles in Agile that I want to talk about tonight. Um, the first three, uh, let me look at where this goes. The first three are um, creating an Agile culture, supporting Agile values and empowering self-organization and excellence, I think are fairly new. There are some aspects of, for example, creating a programming culture that's very common to creating an agile culture that managers have had a role in uh, for a very long time, but it's very specifically an agile culture now. Um, the middle one, scaling Scrum, is what is a manager responsibility that um, that doesn't that I don't think changes very much. I think managers are always responsible for once we're beyond one team, how do we organize? How do we organize the structure of the organization? And then uh, removing impediments, counseling, coaching, and mentoring, hiring, and firing are traditional uh, first-line manager roles. I want to talk about scaling Scrum first because there's it it in Scrum really Scrum and uh, and Agile really introduced a change in thinking about structure. So when we think about a single Scrum a Scrum team, um, that's pretty easy. 
when we get to multiple scrum teams, that's, that's um, and it's one, of the, it's one of the questions that managers ask me most is how do we scale our organization? How do we go from one team to two? How do, we, if we've got 10 teams, how do we deal with that? Um, I did a blog post on it. I'll send that out in the, uh, in the email with the thing if anybody wants this as well. Um, the, the challenge for scaling multiple teams, the easy route is to split by components. And all of you who have dealt with engineering teams know that it's how developers themselves tend to think. The, um, and, and, and actually that's both the problem and the blessing, um, which is uh, developers tend to say, well, you know, I'm a backend developer, let me sit with all the backend developers, or I'm a front-end developer, let me sit with all the front-end developers, or I'm a database developer. I don't know how to speak Java or uh, React. Let me sit with the, the database developers. It's an easy management model. Teams get uh, an attuned manager and uh, mentor and coach. The problem is that our customers don't think in components. Our customers don't care about components. Our customers don't care about the back end. They don't care about the front end. What they care about is functionality and functionality. Very, very little functionality doesn't have doesn't require some front end and some back end and some database and maybe some middleware and some uh, and and constructing things out of multiple functionalities. And when we do that, when we've got teams divided by those functionalities, by those components, and we've got really expensive band, a high bandwidth communication between teams. And the goal of and what Agile has told us is minimize the minimize the cross team communication, minimize the cross team bandwidth maximize the, the teamness of the team. And so the effective route that most agile structures will, will recommend is feature teams, where the goal is delivering customer functionality, not components, and every team has every skill set needed to so deliver those, um, those, that functionality. Teams on interface and functionality and, and customer journeys, um, same skilled folks are scattered across teams but each set still gets an attuned manager, a mentor, a coach if we do matrix organization. <clears throat> so from the left, there's a typical pre-agile team. On the right is, is, is a, um, uh, an agile organized team, set of teams where one, two, three, four, five teams across the top, that are vertical, have, um, have characters within them that represent those different components and can, can build functionality, can own functionality. But notice that the horizontal, there are still, uh, there are still uh, function, functionality groups. The web people are still managed by a web, man uh, by a web manager who was a web developer. The server people are, are managed by someone who was a server person and is now a server manager. So that they have someone who can grow their careers, who can mentor them, who can support them, who can help them debug, all of those kinds of things. Uh, it's that's a similar. It's a similar model, or or maybe we could say that that um, that Spotify is a similar model to this, to what Agile originally came out with. This is the picture of the Spotify model that um, Henrik Nieberg wrote up in his paper, where um, he called the vertical team squads and called the functionally uh, similar groups of people chapters, so that we weren't calling both of them teams. <laughs> which is a problem that many of us have faced. And then, uh, and then layered communities of practice on top, which he called guilds. So um, that's, that's, uh, that's a look at scaling Scrum and a, and a look at, at, at some of the, uh, the issues and opportunities that Agile has given us around scaling Scrum. Hey, um, uh, Ron, yeah. do you want to wait until the end to ask questions or do you want to? Uh, no, I'm happy to take a question about scaling Scrum or anything I've covered already here. I do have a question, Ron. Go um, ahead. Uh, so in your slide where you talk about component teams and feature teams, right? A couple of you know, thoughts I have. How often do these teams stay together? And how much are they self-organizing? So, and these are, you know, yeah, this would my, be aligned to the management role that you're talking talk, about as well. Yeah, I'm going to talk about self-organizing in a minute. 
I noticed the third bullet there. I haven't gotten to that yet. I, I jumped into the middle bullet before I did the first three. So I'm going to tell ah, you. Ah, got, got it, got it. But, All right. but nice. what, was the, what was the first part of that question, Gopal? How, how long do these teams oh, stay together, the component teams? Stay together? So, so there's, there's, real, there's real value to team stability. Team, however, teams can be at the eight person level or they can be at the 50 person level. Um, uh, I will commend to you um, uh, a, book, uh, a book called Tribal Unity, um, uh, a book called Tribal Unity, which, which talks about using SAFE and, and uh, developing that team stability across um, somewhere in the 80 to 100 person range. Um, uh, we have uh, we had speakers here on the um, topic of fast agile, which basically treats teamness at the 50 person, 40 to 50 person range, and forms new teams every two days. But they've got that stability at the 40 to 50 person level, so that those people, when they come together, they're they're familiar with each other, they're used to working with each other, they they they're they um, they've worked with each other before, they have each other's backs, they have the trust and respect that we're looking for as teams. And so I think stability is enormously important. And, uh, and this, this notion of scaling Scrum, of uh, scaling our structures, you know, scaling our organization is a hard problem for managers. Uh, and, and we have to think about that stability and we have to think about whether we can have that stability at the team level and teams can own things as, as they did for some period of time, at least at Spotify. Um, and, and which they do at many organizations actually, uh, or whether we've got that stability at uh, 40 or 50 or, or even 80 person uh, level and, uh, and, it, and those teams reform, but we really spend time building that teamness, whether it's at the eight person level or the 80 person level. I think that's uh, endemic upon managers to support that team building and to ensure that team building happens. Gopal, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. And I get into that a little bit in that blog post that I uh, had up there a few minutes ago that, uh, as I said, I'll send you the pointer to that. Um, um, uh, I can't remember my own blog, <laughs> my own blog URL or I'd tell you again. Um, so let me get into creating it. Was there another question on the chat? Uh, uh, Ron, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the slide which you presented now, actually, a few manager roles in Agile. Uh, the, my question is basically like if an organization hire an Agile coach, actually, is the doesn't the Agile coach responsible for all the points uh, which you have highlighted here? So uh, is, are we like uh, resembling the manager with an oh, Agile coach here? I mean, all of these, all of these things. Yeah. Yeah, so I so I'm not saying yeah I, I uh, that's a good point. So I don't want to say that uh, that that engineering managers own all of creating agile culture. I will say that I believe that managers own own uh, ensuring that the the uh, they that they're supportive of agile culture, and of agile values and of self organization and excellence, um, for the for their teams for their. Uh, chapters for their whatever, whatever that is that that works that whatever that group of people that are in their organization they're responsible for that um, and I want to get into those first three next. Okay, thank you. So, so Ron, the question I asked in chat, um, you know, um, Henrik and and um, folks who are pretty, I mean, Matrix organizations existed before Spotify, but I'm not aware of any companies that were doing that kind of chapter squad model. Um, before Spotify um, in Scrum or any other kind of uh, kind of organizations, who I'm uh, I'm curious who who you are aware of who is doing that that kind of specific kind of manager sitting outside the team um, yes, with did, with uh, functional when, people on different teams model. Yeah, when did uh, when did the less guys write their first book? Because they wrote about it in their first book. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and I'm not going to name either. Uh, um, no, I'm not going to name either of their names right now. And it's a it's a dense book. It's not my favorite book, but um, yeah, they're not my favorite explainers of the 
<laughs> of a process, but I like their process. But uh, but but they claim that this is that this is critical to their. They actually they claim they're the only ones who uh, who, who uh, ever called it out. Crazily enough, Kevin. Yeah, I was just curious because I mean you know I knew it, what Spotify didn't invent it. I just wasn't aware who had done it before. So that's cool. Yeah, there's there's an interesting uh, nugget of wisdom either in our book or on the we've got a page of uh, uh, rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom we've continued to collect. Uh, on our website that um, that 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 compares the what agile calls out and um, and matrix organization um, and it's and it, and it it really is that matrix organization and it and it really is you know we um, yeah I'll leave it as, I'll leave it at that so let me get into creating an agile culture and I, and I want to start with uh, this guy named McGregor so uh, in our book we actually reference uh, three different thought leaders from the 1950s in organizations. And, um, you know, one of them is one that all of us know. Every, so if there's anybody here who doesn't know Maslow, I'll be surprised because Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, is something um, somehow we all, we all learned it somewhere along the way. Um, and, and, Maslow, and Maslow's interesting from an organization standpoint. We talked about why. But, um, but McGregor, McGregor and Pittsburgh are two of the others, and uh, I'll show you Pittsburgh in a minute, but McGregor is the guy who came up with theory X, theory Y. Some of us learned that, probably everybody who went through an MBA program learned it, but most of us in, most of us in engineering didn't, but, uh, but, but we run across it once in a while. What McGregor came across, what McGregor did in the, in the 1950s was to say there's, there's two, you know, there's, there's the way things have been through the, from the Industrial Revolution, from before the Industrial Revolution, where, where managers told people what to do, where they were directive, where they were micromanaging, where they were command and control. And that's not appropriate for the kind of world we're in now. This is the 1950s, the kind of world we're in now. The kind of world we're in now, in the 1950s, managers should be supporting, and, and he called that theory why. And the interesting thing about that was the words that he used there, enabling and empowering and developmental and continuous improvement, are, are exactly the words that we find describing servant leadership as defined in Agile. And so here we are, you know, 40, 50, 60 years later, finally implementing uh, what McGregor was saying we needed to implement in the 1950s. Um, here's Alan Shalloway uh, uh, with Objectives, who a few years ago said, lean, lean agile management is the art of leading people, not managing them, creating the correct environment, focusing them on the right things, trusting them to do their work. In lean agile, the manager has two primary responsibilities, setting the outcomes or goals expected of the team and assisting the doers in creating a better process to get their jobs done. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to share a few rules of thumb with you. This one I heard at Agile Open California 2013, and I wish I knew who it was who said it, but I was so busy capturing it because it so resonated with me that then I missed who it was who had said it. And they said, management sets the boundaries of what needs to be done and says to the team, I trust you to figure out how to get it done, which I think is a marvelous description of what managers' roles are. Uh, and then here's one from Spotify. At Spotify, we trust our people and teams to make informed decisions about the way they work and what they work on. Very similar to, uh, to the one above it. And then here's, here's one. So um, who knows who said trust but verify? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. And who knows who Ronald Reagan was quoting? Gorbachev? Close. <laughs> Eisenhower? Oh. Oh, there we go. Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin actually didn't make it up either. It was a Russian proverb, but, uh, but Lenin, Lenin uh, used it. Um, trust but verify is, 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 is uh, it's really the imperative not to micromanage. It's really the essence of delegation and setting expectations and outcomes for teams and then checking. And uh, in fact, that checking was something I heard from Ellen Lefkoff, who was at the time CEO of Natopia, who, uh, when I asked him about it, said he was quoting Lou Gerstner when he said, I inspect what I expect. And, uh, and the two of them, he heard it from Lou Gerstner when the two of them were McKinsey consultants. 
And I think these two represent what that that man, that management role uh, needs to be. And then this is programming as a team sport. And this has become my rule of thumb over the last decade. Um, uh, it's, you know, what are teams gated by? Collaboration and communication. If, you know, if, uh, if teams are gated by communication and collaboration, then maybe we ought to talk to each other at least once a day. Thus a daily stand up. And, uh, and it means that we have to create a culture of communication at every level with everyone up, down, within, across. Um, Kimberly Weefling, uh, who's one of, the, one of my co-chairs of the Silicon Valley Engineering Leadership Community said, we have two ears and one mouth, use them in this ratio. I started tracking this one down and discovered that she wasn't the first person who said this either. Uh, in fact, I found a quote in Greek from 3000 BC in which someone said this. Uh, but if we use that as the rule of thumb for communication, that we spend more time listening than speaking, then I don't think we can over communicate. I think maybe in sales they can over communicate. I think maybe in marketing they can over communicate. I don't think in engineering we can over communicate. I don't think in product development we can over communicate. And when we've got virtual teams and remote teams, I am certain we cannot over communicate. We have to commit to communicate. And here's Ted Young who pointed out that the distance between teammates, the more you have to formalize communication and make it explicit, make our intention intentional. Um, I will uh, end this section just by saying we wrote a whole chapter on creating uh, programming cultures. And, um, and I think a good programming culture and a good agile culture are one and the same. So let me talk about uh, questions about culture. Well, let me talk about values first because it's so related. Um, the agile principles begin our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. And I think they were wrong. I think our highest priority is to delight the customer. And, uh, and how do we do that? And so does this come down to agile practices? And so there's, there's been so much talk in the being agile, doing agile um, conversation. Uh, and, and every once in a while, I read somebody who, say, who says, uh, you know, agile practices are, are uh, you know, it's like if you're just doing agile practices, you're not getting anything out of it. And I don't think that's true because I think agile practices do deliver value. I uh, went off a few years ago and just listed the, the, the first eight or nine uh, or 10 agile practices that come to mind. And I listed these. And I looked down that list and said, you know, every one of these, uh, every one of these delivers value. There is value every, uh, to every single one of these practices. We, um, you know, let's, let's, let's not claim that agile practices don't give us value uh, because I think they do. Um, and, and I'll talk specifically that uh, two that the study of product team performance discovered. We we asked, uh, as I said, we asked team, we asked members of teams all over the world to characterize are they low performance or high performance or something in between. And then we asked about practices. We asked about standups, and we discovered that those teams that do not do standups, and those teams who say their standups are not effective, correlate with the lowest performance teams. Those teams that have regular standups correlate, the more regular they are up through daily, the higher the performance of the team that they correlate with. Effective daily standups correlate with the highest performance teams. Similarly, definitions of done, those teams that do not have any definition of done correlate with the lowest performance teams. But just having a definition of done does not correlate with being a high performance team. It depends who creates it. When the team itself creates its definition of done, those teams correlate with the highest performance teams. Definitions of done that were created within the team. And those kinds of practices delivered value. We were seeing uh, waterfall teams that were using standups uh, 10, 12 years ago for that very reason. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue for a second and, and say, um, you know, voting machines deliver value too. Voting, voting delivers value. Voting is a practice. Voting machines are tools. But do voting machines and voting make us a democracy? No, because democracy comes from values and principles. Voting and voting machines are, are supportive. They're, they're tools and practices that make it 
easier and, and uh, 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 way more, way easier to do, uh, to be a democracy. But nobody claims voting machines are what makes us a democracy. Similarly, agile practices by themselves don't make us agile. Agile practices only deliver better teams. They don't deliver great teams. Agile values and agile principles are what make, it, what make us agile and what inspire great teams. And, uh, and I'll go to the Agile Manifesto, this being the 20th anniversary month, why we are doing re the Reflect Agile, why we're part, why this talk is part of the Reflect Agile 20 um, uh, month. Uh, the Agile Manifesto called out all these things and the principles behind it uh, called out uh, 12 principles. And I, and I wanna call out these five sets of words, build projects around motivated individuals, trust to get the job done, face-to-face -face conversation, self-organizing teams, the team reflects and tunes and adjusts. Here are principles behind that, those Agile practices that I, find lacking uh, all too often, actually, I'm sorry to say. Um, we need to value the Agile Manifesto over the practices, which brings me to empowering self-organization and excellence. So what is self-organization? So I wanna do a chat storm. And so I need to define what a chat storm is. Uh, I want you to use the chat and I want you to type into the chat uh, a word or two or a very short phrase that for you, so type it in the chat, but do not press enter. Do not press return until I give you the signal to do that because I want everybody to press it at the same time. That's a chat storm. So type into the chat a word or, or a, a short phrase. And if you want more than one, put a comma between them. Don't try doing shift enter or anything because it doesn't actually work in Zoom. You actually, you would enter, you've entered it. Um, there's some squirrely way to do that, but, but so what is self-organization? Give you 15 more seconds. Okay, press return. All right, so I'm gonna let all of you study those. And I wanna I wanna move on to um, Actually, actually, I want to talk a little bit about what, what I think self-organization is. I think it's got to do with everyone on the team being a leader. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk in, um, in about a couple of other characteristics in a minute. But, but I think that, that a self-organizing team is a team in which the entire team comes together to organize. And that means that everyone leads from their area of expertise. Even, even the intern. Uh, if we don't have an intern who can contribute from what they're learning in college, we probably hired the wrong intern. Um, and so if our self-organizing team were not in software, but they were an acting troupe, so you can turn on your mics, I want an answer. What kind of acting do we do if we're a self-organizing team and everyone leads? Improv, improv. yes. Improv. Exactly, we're in an improv group. Why are we an improv group? Because we have a general story or a general agreement on what it is we're, we're doing, but then everybody just jumps in and builds off each other. So you, you listen to what the first, what this person says, and it's a yes and, essentially a yes, and, um, and you just keep going with it. You, you accept what the person before you did and said. That's great, and great, wildly, Melinda, thank you. Uh, you two things, the yes and, which is the B rule of thumb in, in uh, improv. Everyone who's ever taken an improv class, I gave myself one for my birthday a couple of years ago. A wonderful experience. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing that you said was listen. We listen 
to see when we can add, when we can add to what the group is building. And while we're doing, while we're building, while we're leading, we're also listening because someone else may take the lead and take it and take it another direction and add another and onto where, where we were going. And so that listening is a really key component. So if our self-organizing team or music combo, what kind of music do we perform? Yes. Yes. Thank you all. So yes, jazz, because the the uh, the uh, guitarist is going to solo, the uh, bass guitarist is going to solo, the trumpet player is going to solo, the drummer is going to solo. Everybody typically on a, in a jazz group will, will will solo from time to time. Now the problem with both of those is that they don't give us manager models, uh, and I think there is a manager model for for exactly this kind of thing. Um, the manager model being coaching, sports coaching. And I'm gonna give you one specific example of that, that because it was, came up in my manager uh, journey and that's basketball. And it came up not because I know anything about basketball because I really do not know anything about basketball, but it, uh, and, and I didn't follow it. And I had no idea who this guy was when my management coach put a book <laughs> of his into my hand called Sacred Hoops. I had no idea who Phil Jackson was. The only basketball player I think I could have named uh, was Michael Jordan, who it turned out Phil Jackson had inherited when Phil Jackson became the coach of the Chicago Bulls. And the uh, Phil Jackson became the coach and he describes this in Sacred Hoops. So he's only been the, he, he went on from coaching the Chicago Bulls, for those of you who don't know, as I didn't, he went on to coach the LA Lakers. Um, he, um, he talks in this book, well, actually I should show you the other book that I've, uh, that I've read of his. Uh, in, in his two books, he talks about uh, first about uh, arriving at the Chicago Bulls and, and finding the Chicago Bulls, not a team, but Michael Jordan plus four other players or eight other players or however many other players he had on the bench. But it was basically Michael Jordan and and he needed to create a team. So not star programmer and a bunch of other people, but a team that actually worked together and functioned together. And, uh, and the problem was that when he inherited the Chicago Bulls, he inherited Michael Jordan, who was setting every record in basketball, but he also inherited a team that was losing. And the goal in basketball is not for a single player to set records, it is for the team to win. Uh, and notice his second book that I've read, he's uh, written more than this, I think. The second book is 11 Rings. It turns out that when you win a basketball championship, they give you jewelry. They give you rings and he's got 11 of them. Uh, a bunch of, uh, at least one from when he was a player, uh, a bunch of them from when he coached the Chicago Bulls and a bunch of them from when he coached the LA Lakers. And he talks in there about creating a team in which a team, when they, when they get into trouble, they don't look over the bench to him. So we've all seen that happen in sports where, they, where people look over at the coach. Now he's creating a team that they look to each other. And he's creating a team that they look to each other on the court such that, and he, he says, such that not only does the other team not know what my team's going to do next, my team doesn't know what it's going to do next. They're playing in the moment with each other. They're playing like those jazz groups or, 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 like, those, um, uh, or like those improv troops. Uh, and, and he says, and when, and, and he said that, he said, when my team is firing, it's like a jazz group. And I thought, oh, they're like a scrum team. I get basketball now. So that's, I think this is our model. And, uh, and we can look to uh, uh, a very recent uh, uh, Golden State Warriors teams that, that uh, were, were winning championships against arguably the best player in basketball, whose name I can't remember because I don't know basketball, but I remember how, that, how I knew it when I was watching. A uh, uh, bunch of good players. Uh, I'm, I'm not arguing that the Golden State Warriors don't have a bunch of great players, but, but they were playing against the best guy in basketball, I think. Uh, and, uh, and they beat him. And they beat him by playing as a team. There was, uh, in, uh, in fact, you could argue that Steph Curry is, is um, the best guy in basketball. But there was a game in one of those championship games in which Steph Curry couldn't hit a shot. 
I think we made five points the whole game and, and their team won. That, that ability to play as a team is, is what I think a role of a manager is, is to be that coach. That, uh, and I think, I think this is true of agile coaches as well to that earlier question. Um, so uh, I, wanna, I wanna raise this question because it came up when I started training teams in agile 12 years ago, this came up fairly frequently as their projects not suitable for agile. I, I, you know, I, I, we were still, we weren't a critical mass for agile. <laughs> And there were a bunch of, uh, you know, there were a bunch of um, projects, you know, where every, everybody was, was well, you know, is this going to work for our kind of programming? It's going to work for our kind of projects, our kind of products. Um, and, uh, and I really struggled with the answer to this question because I didn't know the answer. But I had, I thought, you know, if there's one thing, it's, it would be not appropriate for it would be embedded microcontroller programming. And I've done that. And, uh, and, and it might not be appropriate because of the hardware, but in fact, Scrum these days is being used for hardware development as we had uh, Kevin Thompson here talking about last week. Um, and what I realized, it took me a few years actually, sorry to say, it took me a few years to realize the question's not quite right. The question really is, uh, is, are, is, is there um, a culture that's not suitable for Agile? And that's this one, micromanagement. Because while Agile calls for everybody on the team to step up, micromanagement really causes everyone to step back. And micromanagement disrupts Agile. It prevents best teams. It prevents learning. And it uh, causes teams to become order takers. So Esther Derby said uh, a long time ago, when teams self-organize, there's still plenty, of plenty for managers to do. A manager's job is to engineer the organization so that teams can do their best work. And, uh, and I want to point to this. This is, this is Hertzberg. This is modified Hertzberg, actually, my co-author. Hertzberg did it across the board, all workers, all fields, all industries. Uh, you know, what motivates them and what, uh, and what demotivates them. And, and the marvelous thing that Hertzberg did was to say, there, there are not only things that motivate people, there are things that demotivate people, and those are different. So here we're looking at the blue as the motivators, the red are the demotivators, and, 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 the, and it's a slight modification on Hertzberg for what, we, what Mickey and I, my co-author and I believe about programmers, making a difference in the world there on the left, probably the biggest motivator for, for many, many, many programmers. A ton of us got into engineering to make a difference in the world, to, uh, to make an impact on the world, to make the world a better place, learning and growing, toys and technology, recognition and praise. Um, you know, this is something that managers provide is, is you know, recognition and praise, making sure that there are toys and, and, and technology to play with making sure that their folks are learning and growing. I was talking about mentoring and coaching a few minutes ago at growing people and making a difference in the world, making that connection between the, the mission of the company, the mission of the product and the work that every individual on the team is doing is, is just enormously important. And then when you look at demotivators, there's respect for supervisor being number one. So there's a, a, a rule of thumb in HR that says that people don't leave companies, they leave managers. And um, and and it's you know when they when they lose respect for their managers they're out they're, they they head for the door, uh, and then you see other things like company policies and administration. No, I, I don't know anyone who's ever joined a company for its company policies and administration. I bet a bunch of you know people who've left companies because of their company policies and administration. So that difference between motivators and demotivators is just is just uh, really powerful. And a powerful thing to to uh, to recognize. So, hey, Ron, to... yes. One surprising thing in the graph: having fun is a demotivator. Uh, so um, having a lack of. So you have to word, put the word "lack of" in front of uh, uh, lack ah, of. Or, uh, okay, got it. Got that it. That juju in front of uh, uh, the things for, for for them to be demotivators. Sorry, uh, Ron. I'm also surprised. I'm What's also that? surprised. I'm also surprised friendship and or um, psych safe, psycho safety. <laughs> Maybe it's not, it was not a term back then, but I'm also surprised they're absent. Uh, well, we see interpersonal relationships there, um, which are which are important for both uh, lack of a lack of interpersonal relationships uh, can can be a demotivator, uh, and 
it's the sixth most highest motivator before before a ton of other things. Oh, my bad. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I, you know, some of these things get labels that are not quite the same as what we're looking for. So I totally get it. Other other questions before I move on. So I'm going to do very brief coverage of. We've talked about scaling Scrum. I want to talk about removing impediments because all of us know who removes impediments: Scrum masters. But all, all of us also know who Scrum masters escalate to, escalate impediments that they can that, that they can't handle or they haven't got the political uh, wherewithal to handle, and and uh, and removing impediments gets escalated. So Diana Larson, um, who we uh, had as a speaker a couple of months ago said managers are still needed, not so much for their planning and controlling ability, but for the important job of interfacing on the team's behalf with the rest of the organization. It is, it is, it is one of the links that teams uh, can leverage into the rest of the organization for impediment removal, as well as for um, uh, evangelizing the team's work and evangelizing the team's process with the rest of the organization. Um, I think this was this is a really important impediment to remove, which is the noise. Um, there's um, there's a, a, a torrent of politics in most of our organizations that um, that managers uh, managers of all kinds, engineering managers, um, uh, agile uh, servant leaders, um, uh, directors of, of engineering, product managers, um, all of us. It behooves all of us to be a damper to the noise. Um, removing uh, removing impediments includes making sure our teams have slack. The point is not to be busy all the time. The point is to, um, uh, well, if we're delivering pizza, I sure want to be on the left street, not the right one in this picture. Um, slack, slack gives us the ability to actually move quickly. And uh, protecting team focus, keeping keeping uh, keeping down the work in progress, keeping down the work in process, keeping down the uh, the multitasking, keeping down the multi project uh, kind of stuff because all of that lends itself to uh, to bad uh, bad performance and, uh, and and to, and to painfulness and to uh, you know uh, protecting team focus brings joy in the team. Uh, counseling, co counseling, coaching, and mentoring. Um, actually, I think these two girls are, are pair programming, uh, not mentoring each other, but, um, but you can also call pair programming a form of co-mentoring. Um, and, I, and I, besides which I like the photograph. Um, I liked this comment from Spotify. At Spotify, managers are focused on coaching, mentorship, and solving impediments rather than telling people what to do. And I'll move on from there to hiring and firing. Most most teams there are, there are a few exceptions, but most teams really they want to be part of the hiring process, but they don't want to run the they don't want to run the logistics of the hiring process. Uh, it's it's um, time heavy, and uh, and one of the rules of thumb for managers is to always be recruiting, and it's. Um, it is being out there in the world, meeting uh, uh, potential recruits, keeping track of recruits, hiring people who you interviewed five years before who weren't appropriate for the job then, but but maybe are now. Um, really, always being recruited, even if the even if the um, the hiring window is closed, always being recruiting with the possibility of doing um, uh, opportunistic hires. Uh, that happens once in a while, but always being ready for when the hiring window does open. And dealing with problem employees. Um, one, of, one of the rules for managers is that um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure I've ever met a manager who has done a lot of hiring, who's had a perfect record. Occasionally you hire a problem employee. I was uh, in the gloating phase of my management uh, at the point at which I suddenly found that the guy I'd hired, uh, who um, uh, he didn't walk the he didn't walk his talk, 
He, uh, he really convinced me and all of the interviewers that he was on target for what we needed and he wasn't. Um, dealing with problem employees is something that um, your team expects, uh, uh, expects managers to handle. Um, they all know if they've got a problem employee on their team, if they've got a problem employee in their midst and they expect managers to apply osmosis, know that that exists. And so boy, it, it behooves us to uh, in our, in our really listen in on our folks uh, in, and have regular one-on-ones. So I wanna, I wanna jump to um, a final set of observations that Google made, Google being the data wizards of uh, technology. Google in 2002 ran an uncontrolled experiment by simply getting rid of all of its managers. It didn't go well. Um, the founders found themselves deluged with signing off on vacation forms and um, uh, uh, coordinating uh, coordinating a ton of stuff and um, it, it didn't go well. Uh, but they didn't fully learn the lesson until 2008. So many of you know about Project Aristotle, which is um, which, which really introduced the term um, psychological safety. Um, and if you don't know about uh, Project Aristotle, go off and Google Project Aristotle because it's well worth following up. The New York Times story on it uh, is just outstanding. And there are a couple of Google Docs that are well, uh, um, Google documents, not Google Docs, Google documents that are well worth reading about uh, Project Aristotle, but Project Oxygen as well, because in 2008, they decided to prove what many people at Google thought, which was that managers don't matter. And they fairly quickly discovered the opposite, managers matter a lot. And one of the things that they discovered was what employees valued most were even keeled bosses who made time for one-on-one -on -one meetings, who helped people puzzle through problems by asking questions not dictating answers, and who took an interest in employees' lives and careers. And high scoring, they found that high scoring managers in those things saw less turnover on their teams than other teams had. Their retention was related much more strongly to manager quality than to seniority, to performance, to tenure or to promotions. The data also showed a tight connection between managers' quality and workers' happiness. So how do we manage in an agile world? To sum up, we trust our people, we empower self-organization and excellence. We expect and enable truly shared leadership. We model and defend and evangelize agile values. We foster a culture of communication. We encourage teamwork and collaboration. We shield teams from politics and distraction. We take care of stuff. We take care of teams. And do we really need managers in an agile world? Well, they're critical to, managers can be, can be, if they know the roles, they can be critical to agile transformational success. They can play key roles in Agile. They can play key roles in creating Agile culture and in removing impediments. But Agile demands that managers like everyone else be proactive and understand their roles and adapt to the changed roles in managers' cases and really understand them. So with that, I'll uh, take questions that have been queuing up. So Mal, Everyone, thank you very much for, for your talk. It was really, really insight, insightful. I already bought the book to see all the all the things in, in Amazon. Uh, my question go, goes like this. Uh, you talked a little bit about the, the Agile Manifesto, and of course, we're now celebrating the 20 years of, of it. And you mentioned a little bit some of the changes, but uh, what are what changes would you put in the Agile Manifesto if it was being work uh, right now in 2021? So I wouldn't change it. I, I, so I, in, in my agile trainings, 
I will have teams uh, do a go round and, and each person read one of the principles and relate it to the values at the top. Now, I'm not saying that the Agile Manifesto is perfect and, and, and it, yeah, no means do I think that's the case, but I think it's like the, the Declaration of Independence. It's worked, really well. it's worked really well. It could work really well for as many years going forward as it's worked in the past. I, you know, it, I, I, it's, good, it's, it, it's, it's good enough and it's really good. Thank you. So, but uh, but thank you for the comments on the book, and I'm I'm going to show you this, but uh, but we're going to we're going to raffle a copy of the book, um, and so to raffle a copy of the book, what I want to do is, um, tell you, so so um, here's here's the deal. If you um, uh, put in uh, either so put into chat, so we're going to do a chat storm. And uh, put either your name or your email address. If you, if you uh, want an email from me, that's a follow-up with the uh, URLs and stuff that are in this talk and a pointer to the, to the slides, put your email address there. If you don't want that, just put your name in. Um, and, and one of the, so we're, this is the chat storm. So um, one of you will win a copy of the book. And uh, and I'll send you a, and I'll send you a code for that. And if you put your name in, it will be uh, I'll ask you for your email address. Uh, so uh, type that in. Don't hit return yet. Um, so I see people hitting return. So you're going to have to type it in again. Because I'm looking for what's underneath the line. So put it in. Do not hit return. Okay, now hit return. Okay, and and, um, and beforehand, I um, decided that I would pick the seventh one of those in the chat. So, uh, um, Gopal, or sorry, uh, yeah, Gopal, can you can you look for who's the seventh one after that dotted line that I put across there? Let me check. Give me a second. And, uh, and I'll take questions. And so I'll go back to here. Mm. So uh, take us, uh, you know, if you didn't win, if you didn't win, I want a copy of the book, take the, get the, get the 35% code here, uh, or the video training for that matter. Take a screenshot of this, of this shot. Kapal, who's seventh? I'm trying to find the dotted line. Oh, there's a lot in there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really uh, right about me. <laughs> so a dotted line. I, I think don't it see. Steven. I don't see. You're, you're going to see Ron having put it in. Oh, there, yeah, I see uh, the dotted line and then Mao, Vicky, Roshin, it's, it's Mike, Dante, it's Mike, Grace, and David Geisler. I think you won it. Yeah, I oh, think, you gotta, you gotta be kidding. Yeah, I think it's David, the seventh one. Are we in agree? Are we in agreement? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. Woohoo! No, yeah, I was just, I was just below David. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Congratulations, David. As, an, as I said, I was teasing. <laughs> You're great. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to bring Beautiful. this down momentarily. So tell me if anybody anybody else is trying to take a, a screenshot here. Otherwise, I'm going to bring it down. Questions? So more questions from the talk? <laughs> oh, good. No questions. So are we ready to wrap up? We might be. There is there is one question in the chat. Oh, Ron. good. And what's that? Would a manager be infringing on Scrum Master's role as it relates to Agile Scrum values practices? <laughs> Honestly, I think it's I think it's all of our responsibility. But I think managers, but I think managers are well positioned to um, to uh, to really contribute. 
Well, my opinion is all managers should be fired. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, well, you you uh, you you have not learned from Google. <laughs> Uh, I study uh, let's prove them wrong. <laughs> well, no, I agree that managers are an important role. Like most roles in an organization or a company, there's always value for that role. And, and for many companies I'm working with right now, we're trying to figure out how certain roles and certain individuals can upskill and, and change their career path and roles. And I, I see that a lot of companies now in the project manager, program manager role versus product manager, product owner role, scrum master. There's there's a lot of variation and, and changes going on. So I think we always have to have people that uh, manage self-managed teams. I know that's, that's a joke, <laughs> but but I, I think that's a reality. I think, I, I really think it is. And I think Ron, pointed it out that uh, that's just the way things are. And and uh, and it's important that we take that in consideration. So I wanna thank Ron for his valuable time, his insight, his wisdom that uh, he decided to share with us. Uh, reach out to Ron, he, he's a very nice person. He'll respond and talk to you and 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 have, uh, you know, communications with you. So it's all cool. We have, uh, we have Andrew and Mao with their, uh, Mao had his hand up actually. Andrew's got his hand up. Go ahead. I'm just clapping. Oh. That was a, that was a clapping symbol. That was a clapping symbol. And Mao, Mao, are you clapping or asking a question? Oh, Same no, clapping, I, thank you. He was, I stole it from him actually. I was not clapping. That's Maru up there. Yeah, I want, I want to tell you, I, I have a theory with managers. It's like uh, they're the father of, uh, I don't know how many kids from different families, and at the same time, they're a friend, and at the same time, they're a banker. Try to, try to get that to work out. Ah, that's cool. That's interesting. It's a parent, parent relationship almost. That's cool. I like that. So I, um, uh, Mickey and I each dedicated the book to... Um, to uh, our own uh, our own choices, and I dedicated the book to my kids, from whom I learned a ton about managing. Or they manage you, which is it? Yes. <laughs> That's in, in both cases. <laughs> All right. Go yeah, ahead. There's, there's a lot of serious serious research. I gotta find the reference and send it on the fact that cats might be manipulating humans with some secret gene that they somehow found a way to control us through. I'm going to find the link or the research and send it to you because nobody believes this. I'm going to send you the link. Great. As long as you don't get it from the QAnon website. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh my God, no. I'd rather, I'd rather kill myself. Well... Uh, Ron, having played jazz uh, in the past, I appreciated the uh, the reference to a jazz group. I think uh, Miles Davis might disagree with you about the managing part, though. Oh. Uh, I would also add that you, you th there's also sometimes a need for a little bit of punk rock on these teams as well, because it adds a bit of disruption when things get stale. Um, and I think it, it sometimes is a back to basics approach, which is very lean. Uh, it removes <laughs> a lot of the waste from the process. So. Right. Great, God great. save the queen. <laughs> Good comment. I've also played that. So. Yeah, there was a question about recording of this event. Jay, do you want to answer the question? It's it's. Uh, I'll send it out in three or four days. I'm I'm like a four weeks behind you all, uh, but I'm gonna try my best over the next three days to get caught up. So I apologize, but I will. It will be sent out, and I generally send it out to everyone that's on the meetup everybody and we'll put it in the agile 20 reflect festival as well so just, just bear with me so i'm going to catch up over the next four but four days i've only got like four of them ron had mentioned in another after another meetup that uh that i think you guys are short of volunteers or or uh the editing 
uh, depends on how quick, how much uh, you can, time you can devote to it because you, uh, you're you volunteering, I guess. So if you need help, uh, I can help out in that regards. Oh, great. So Alfonso, I'll reach out to you. Are you kidding? If you volunteer, you're going to, you're going to work. <laughs> uh, that's fine. <laughs> That's, that's fun. That's really cool. That's really cool. Thank yeah. you. So, so like most yeah. of us, we have a job that pays us, and I'm working at one of the largest banks in the world with their agile transformation. So, it's the last few weeks. It's just been sucking up my life. It's just like a black hole. So, I'm trying to overcome that, you all. So, I apologize, but I'm doing the best I can. Uh, but I, but the problem I have is that. You know, my Zoom account, I'm the only one that can upload it to the, our YouTube account and then upload because I'm the only one that has access and rights. So I got to figure out how to share that with others. That share the pain is important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, but if it's a self organizing team and, and you're the one. Oh, we lost you, Alfonso. Yeah. Sorry, Ron, we were waiting for Alfonso. What was the jazz metaphor or analogy you you, you made? A self-organizing uh, self organizing team, if it were not oh. in software, if it were in music, would be playing jazz. Uh-huh. Who's giving the cadence? Who's giving the measures? The lead. Every, yeah, every, everyone leads. That's right. But, but, but only one person leads at a time. That's right. Yeah. And that leadership passes transparently among the members of an improv group or a jazz troupe or uh, or uh, Phil Jackson's basketball teams. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, Ron, I don't mean to be boring because I know we're kind of talking about some fun things. I just had another question about the content, but um, I'm just curious about uh, removing impediments. Um, I know it's both the scrum master's job and the manager's job. What, what do you advise when you see some conflict there? Um, you know, maybe some, some in engineering managers might be territorial about that or the scrum masters territorial about that. There, there, are, there are people who are territorial about only wanted, wanted to be the only person who removes impediments. Yeah, kind of like, um, oh, something happened on the team. So then the engineering manager is gonna go chase it down, but then they don't include the scrum master and it is on the scrum masters team so then the scrum master doesn't know and then they're having this secret meeting but then they don't want to invite the scrum master because they don't think it's the scrum master's business because it's technical um or the scrum master may be doing some some you know holding a meeting that's overly technical and then the uh, the manager gets upset because the manager felt like they should have belonged to that so you're yeah. just kind of trying to figure out how to get them all to play nice. yeah sometimes that can be an individual sometimes that can be an individual problem sometimes it's a cultural problem but in either case, it's um, it's it's one that calls uh, that rule of thumb of you can't over communicate is is I think one that uh, I don't think you could over collaborate either, and, and I think it's one that needs needs to be brought to brought to attention and um, 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 you know I've, I've been in organizations in which um, engineering and product management are are not aligned and uh, and boy the difference when when um, engineering and product management are aligned and they're not is dramatically different and it's and it's dramatically different in terms of productivity um, it's dramatically different in terms of, of, um, of uh, morale uh, as well and I, so I think you can I think you can chase it down along lines of productivity you can chase it down along lines of morale that um, that we need that we we uh, we need to be talking to everybody else. We need to be collaborating with everyone else, and we need to be communicating with everyone else. And software development is a team sport, and that's the and, and I, I said somewhere along the way, you know, this has become my mantra in the last decade, and it really has because um, I think when that doesn't happen, it's 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 when we when we see the um, the where when and where we see the failures and and um, and productivity from everything from productivity to team joy. I love that. That's great. I think talking about you can't over collaborate is a really good way to start those types of conversations. You know, instead of being territorial, you know, what's the harm of opening the door and 
um, you know, sharing this information and helping each other out. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's some corporate cultures that that's that um, short of blocking out the corporate culture for your product organization, short of that, um, that corporate culture in, is invasive um, in, uh, in, in its politics and um, um, uh, um, uh, wanting that kind of ownership, which is, which is not healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to add a point there. Um, so, it's, you know, I, I don't disagree with everything that is said, Ron, in terms of the corporate culture, but there is also a level of responsibility for the Scrum Master to provide value to the team. And they need to show that they are actually there. I mean, if, if they create a compliance slash hostile env environment, the chances are people are not going to include them in discussions. So you got to watch out for that, even though there are certain gatekeeping activities for a Scrum Master. So I just, I just want to point out that there is that aspect to this, the individual aspect to it, and the relationship aspect to it as well. Yeah, no, I, 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 totally, I totally agree. Um, the, the question becomes, do you end up tilting against windmills or do you have a, uh, and, and, and some, and, and I, I, I think it's possible to, uh, to shut out. Um, yeah. I, so, you know, we talk about this, um, actually in creating, uh, in creating culture, what the very first thing the, in, in looking at culture is what's the corporate, what's the corporation's culture? What's, what's its mission? What's its values? And are those and and then secondly, are they living their values? So uh, Enron Enron was Enron had a really great set of values. There was pretty much zero living of them, as far as I can tell. But they are a great set of values, and and if you got that set of values, you can leverage those as a manager for your organization. You know, if it talks about teamwork, you can leverage teamwork. That's that's a great value that you can leverage, even if the rest of the company is not doing it. Hey, our value says we're doing teamwork, and and you can leverage that because because those values tend they tend to be like inside the door or you know posted somewhere or you see, you uh, you know people carry them around their wallet cards, and 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 you can leverage that kind of stuff. Um, and at the same time, there may be ones that um, that, that get in your way, and you've got to you've got to block the you've got to block and tackle and all that stuff. So I was at Schwab, and Schwab had um, had uh, uh, values around teamwork that were really strong. Um, it had it had values on uh, on on delivering value to customers that were really strong. But what, what, what tended to happen was it was so focused on delivering, it was, it was focused on uh, relentlessly delivering functionality and features to customers that caused developers blinders to come down and not learn from the, from the person sitting right next to them and not share with the person who's sitting right next to them. And software development's a team sport. We need that teamwork. And, and, we, and, and so how do, you, how do you as leaders emphasize the parts of that that those values that we can that we can create the kind of culture that we need for our for our um, agile for our agile teams. All right, everyone, I'm going to put on my Scrum Master hat and say it's like three minutes till. So I think we have to close. Uh, but uh, again, I want to thank Ron and everyone else who attended, hopefully this provided value to you. We're gonna have more of these, you know, we're gonna have March, April, May, pretty packed. Um, we're gonna talk about really cool stuff. So come back and join us. I think our next one may be about Agile and internal audit, maybe about Agile and how, how do you stand up 250 and 300 teams and the product layer in a year? in a major company it's it's challenging so well that might be a topic as well and we're going to have some other cool people coming on not as cool as ron but other people that are going to come out and talk um so come back and join us but thank you everyone i'm going to thank everyone and appreciate everyone and end 
our our kind of uh, event tonight. So thank Who you all. Do that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank hey, you very much. Uh, one question, one question, one question. Hey, Ron. Hi. Ron, um, this is Dave. I, I put a question in the chat, but I was wondering if you were okay with me referring, uh, refer referencing some of your work for this, um, for my backlog item of checking or of understanding management and what their role is. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome to quote me. Yeah, no, I just, I just want to make sure that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what authors write books for is to... Uh, <laughs> okay, beautiful. Thank you very uh, much. Two, two things. One is, to be, one, is to be quoted, one is to be quoted and one is to, uh, to be able to go back and, and realize, oh, yeah, I knew that stuff once. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of these days you'll go to the company where I am at, like, hey, just that, that's my stuff. <laughs> All right. Okay, Ron, really appreciate it. Thanks for the book. <laughs> yep, I will take care. I'll be seeing you your code Thank to you. download. Thank you, Ron. Cheers. Bye bye.